And everyone else, let's turn to Genesis chapter 3 in your Bibles, please. Genesis chapter 3 will be the text this morning. Genesis chapter 3. What we found, those of you who have been following along for many weeks, you know that at the end of chapter 2 of Genesis, everything was right. Everything was in order. God, Adam, Eve, and creation. You see that? God was over Adam. Eve was taken out of Adam's side. He was Eve's head. And then all the creation, all the animal kingdom, followed under their leadership. But in chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent entered. The lowest, do you get that? The lowest and tempted Eve, who tempted Adam to be like God. And they sinned and usurped the authority of God, sinned against God. And then we found, we found last week where God came. And who did he hold responsible? Who did he call out to and say, where are you? It was Adam. And what did Adam do? He blamed Eve. Who blamed the serpent? So now, we're picking up in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. God is going to deal with each one and put everything back in order, beginning with the serpent. And then he goes to Eve. Then he goes to Adam, because he is God. So God is here, beginning at verse 14 this morning, putting everything back into order. Although Adam and Eve sinned, and of course the effects of that sin still affect us today, we can know that God set things straight. That is the heart of this message this morning. God has not left human beings without hope. God has not left fallen humanity without hope. So let's stand, please, as we read Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the servant, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Oh God, we know that the verses we just read are referred to by theologians as the first gospel. The first gospel. We find hope here, indeed, during the curse. As you curse the serpent, Lord, you give hope to humanity. So God, help us, Lord, to find this hope. And Lord, if there's anyone listening to my voice who needs hope in their life, and they look for it everywhere else. May they hear the truth of your word and discover hope today. Hope in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And we know, Lord, verse 15 is about Him. So, Lord, please, give us understanding. And, Lord, help us to draw strength and comfort and truth from this your word. We pray these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to deal with verse 14 first. Verse 15 is going to be the heart of the message. Let's go with verse 14 because the Lord said to the serpent. Now remember, God here is addressing the serpent of the field. So point number one, the curse of of the serpent of the field. And God did indeed curse the serpent. He said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are what? Cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. God here was cursing the serpent of the field, the physical, literal serpent. And as I've explained to you a few weeks ago, I believe, it is hard, difficult for us to understand the link between Satan and the serpent of the field. But we know that there is one because here God cursed the serpent of the field. And that word curse is used throughout the Old Testament 
an expression in Genesis, but it means simply a pronouncement of judgment. A pronouncement of judgment. And we hear, see here in chapter 3 that God also cursed the ground for Adam's sake. And in chapter 4, he curses Cain for murdering his brother Abel. And then we see that Noah indeed cursed his youngest son, Ham. And then God said in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and what? Curse those who curse you. So we see this curse is used throughout the Old Testament, but it's simply a pronouncement of judgment. And God pronounces judgment upon the serpent of the field. So, note this, just as the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, now the serpent is more cursed than any beast of the field. Did you catch that? Indeed, in verse 14, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. But in verse 1 of chapter 3, the Bible describes the serpent as the beast, as what? More cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now the serpent is more cursed than any beast beast of the field. How so? Have you thought about that? Simply this. God said what? All thy belly you shall go. And what? Eat dust all the days of your life. The curse of the serpent of the field was the curse of humiliation. Humiliation. And the serpent still what? Slithers on the ground. And not literally eats dust, but what? Figuratively must eat dust all of his life. And that is indeed a saying that we have today. How many times have we heard this? So and so is a snake in the grass. And remember the old West? Marshall Dillon? To the bad guys, why don't you what? Slither out of here on your belly, right? We know that what? There is disgrace, there is humiliation with the serpent. You know, I've noticed this too. How many other animals fear snakes? Do horses like snakes? Oh. Jason knows that really well. <laughs> Do dogs like snakes? I've never met a dog who likes a snake. Other animals, I think, also what? Find snakes repulsive. And snakes are what? Always slithering around. That is a curse of the serpent of the field. And human beings, we know, if we're honest, there is something indeed quite fascinating, but yet repulsive about snakes. I remember when I was a kid, I'd love to go to the Pike Stem State Park Nature Center. And I didn't care about the bugs. I didn't care about the hornet's nest. I didn't care about anything else in the Nature Center except for the snakes in the cage. As long as they were behind glass, I could watch them all day long. Because there was something that fascinated me as a little boy about snakes, and in fact, it still does. I like to see them if they're behind glass, but I don't like to see them in my backyard. But I don't kill black snakes or garter snakes, but I still don't exactly enjoy seeing them because I find them repulsive, but there's still something fascinating about them. And remember what Jesus said. He said for us to what? Be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. So this is a curse of the serpent. There's something fascinating, something wise about them, but there's also something quite repulsive. And this goes back to the curse. So I hope you don't see too many snakes this summer in your backyard. But when you do, notice the reaction that you have and that most people have. This is a curse. It's real. I just wanted you to see this, that there is a difference between the curse of the serpent of the field and number two, what we're going to really focus the message on, the condemnation of the serpent of old. Okay? God deals in verse 14, the serpent of the field. But then in verse 15, he turns to the serpent, the real serpent of old, Satan, who was what? Behind the real temptation. Who was really, who was really the tempter in the garden. And he turns and he addresses Satan in verse 15. And God says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall what? Bruise his heel. What are we to make of Genesis 3.15? What are we to make of this? <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, listen to me very carefully. We must understand Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, 
If we are to understand the rest of the Bible and the crucifixion, <coughs> resurrection, and ascension of Christ, everything hinges on us properly understanding Genesis 3, 15. Because God here is dealing with the condemnation of the serpent of old. And know what he says. God says, and I. This is God speaking, and I will, what? Put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I want to ask you something. Is a head wound a mortal wound? Yes, this is what the Bible is speaking of. A head wound is a mortal wound. But what about the heel? Not a mortal wound, but where, where do snakes usually strike? At the heel, right low. But it's not a mortal wound, but what? It is painful. It is painful. And this, this God said this enmity will, be, will continue between your seed and her seed. Okay? And that word enmity simply means an intensity of hostility experienced by nations at war. So this is not just a general dislike. It's not like they, you know, you're going to go like each other. It's what? It's, it's, it's hostility that really wants what? To destroy, to destroy that you're going to experience. This enmity is going to be between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And this is going to be reality because what? I'm going, God said, and I will put this enmity there. I'm going to do it. And that's a condemnation that the, the serpent of old and his seed had. And what about that word seed? You know, it's, it's ambiguous in that it can mean two different things. And indeed, can it can refer to an individual offspring or a group. So the word simply means offspring. And we use that a lot, don't we? We say our offspring. If we have one child, we say this is my offspring. Or you can have what? Ten kids. Say these are my offspring. Or you can have your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Say these are my offspring. Or you can have one child. And here, the word in the Hebrew can mean what? One individual or indeed a group. But this seed, this seed is going to come from the woman and from the serpent. You ever considered who was the serpent's seed? Because the serpent of old had offspring. Who was the first? It was none other than Cain. Cain. Because we know what did Cain do? He murdered his brother Adam. But when Cain was born, if you look in chapter 4, verse 1, Adam knew his wife, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And look what he said in Genesis 4, 1. I have acquired a man from the Lord. What did he think when Cain was born? She always saw, obviously thought, this is the seed. The promised one that God promised me. I have acquired a man from God. And Eve was all excited. But undoubtedly as Cain grew up and got older and Eve began to see his sin, she knew this was not the promised seed. But then Abel was born. And she saw what? Good things in Abel. But then what happened? Well, you know the story. Cain rose up because of jealousy. And he slew Abel, his brother, and murdered. The first murder took place. So Cain was indeed the seed of the evil one. And that's the reason that in 1 John 3.12, the Bible says this in 1 John 3.12, Not as Cain, who was what? Of the wicked one. Cain was what? The seed or the offspring of the wicked one because he what? Murdered. His brother. Cain murdered his brother Abel. And then we know what? Cain's offspring, we thought, well, they were done away with in the flood. Right? Because only eight people were saved in the flood. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and, and his three sons' wives were saved in the flood. But what? The youngest son? The youngest son man? You know the curse that Noah proclaimed to him in Genesis chapter 9? And then what? We see that he became the father of the Canaanite nation. 
What did the Canaanites do? What, didn't they battle against Israel all through the book of what? Joshua? And, and, and the nation of Israel? The sea was what? Pushing, always trying to land because they were evil, wicked people. So remember this. All through the Old and New Testament, you see what Satan see outnumbering, outnumbering the seed of the promised one, the seed of Eve. Indeed, the seed of the evil one outnumbers this. And this is what you saw in Jesus' time too. And Jesus addresses the Jewish people. And you would think they thought they were the children of Abraham, right? But Jesus addressed them and identified them and where their true seed was. Where they really originally from. Who their father was. And he did this in John chapter 8. And I want you to turn there in the New Testament. John chapter 8 verse 37. And the Jew, Jewish people here, they were very secure. They were very self-righteous because they were children of Abraham. But Jesus had something to say to them here in John chapter 8, verse 37. I want you to turn there. John chapter 8, verse 37. Jesus says to the Jews, I, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. I know that you descended physically from Abraham. I know that. But, Jesus said, you seek to kill me. That he came and killed Abel, his brother. Yeah. Jesus said, you seek to kill me. Why? Because my word has no place in you, Jesus said. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God, and Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. No wonder the Jews picked up stones here in just a few moments if you keep reading in John chapter 8 and what? Wanted to kill Jesus on the spot. How dare how dare Jesus in their minds, how dare this man tell us we are not children of God because we're descended from Abraham. How dare he tell us, the Jewish people, that we are children of who? Satan. But Jesus what? He told them the truth. But they didn't want to hear that. Satan's seed has always outnumbered Christ seed. Did you know that? Always outnumbered numeric. Always been more people. What did Jesus say? Broad is the way that leads where? To destruction. But narrow is the way that leads where? Why? How many found the narrow way? Few. But Jesus here told the truth. But they didn't want to believe it. He told the truth. You are of your father, the devil. And his will you want to do. And this is true with every human being, unfortunately, who is born by natural being. The Bible makes it clear that every human being is born into what? Sin. Every human being. What did, what did David say to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the book of Psalms? In sin, my mother conceived me. And that is something that we don't like to think about too much. But the truth is, every one of us was what? 
born into sin. We inherited the sin of our parents, so to speak, Adam and Eve. And by default, we become children of who? Really, the wicked one. And Jesus here was saying to the Jews, you know, even though you're descendants of Abraham and you think you're righteous and you think you're secure, you're really not because you don't do the works of Abraham. You don't do the works of God. You don't know my father. I know, but you don't know. And Jesus here gives him a grave warning. And he gives us a grave warning. But Genesis chapter 3 also gives us a great consolation. Okay, I told you the bad news. Now I want to tell you the good news. Look at point number three. The consolation of the seed of the woman. Getting back to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall what? Bruise his heel. Something fascinating that you see, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to look at Genesis chapter 4. And I want you to look at verse 25. Because Satan thought that he would. Remember, what did God say? I'm going to put enmity. There's going to be a hostility between your two seeds, Satan's seed and the woman's seed. And what? All this hostility. He shall what? Bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. And Satan and the seed did everything that they could to what? Stop the promised one, the Messiah, the anointed one from coming. And how did Satan first start? With Cain murdering who? Abel. Because Abel was righteous, Cain was wicked. So could you imagine how Adam and Eve must have felt? Maybe Adam come to Eve and said, Well, Eve, my wife, we had two sons. One is a murderer, and the other one is a martyr. Cain murdered his brother Abel. Eve what about the promise? Don't you think maybe Adam and Eve really, really were frustrated and really began maybe to doubt, struggle with things? God promised that the seed of the woman would try. God promised, I would bear a son. But look, if you will, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. Now look what she said. She named him Seth because she says, For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. He says, God has what? Appointed another seed because Cain killed Abel, but he's given me another. He's given me this Seth, another son. And look at verse 26. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And then men began to what? Call on the name of the Lord. And if you look at the line of Seth, and then you look at the end of chapter 5, and you see there's a man named Noah. Named Noah. And he was a descendant of Seth. And all the world, as I said, was wiped out by the flood except for eight individuals. But Noah, the descendant of Seth, the line, the seed was preserved. God made sure of that on the ark. And then what do we find? Indeed, the seed of Satan pops up again in him. Noah's youngest son. But Noah's oldest son is named who? In verse 32 of chapter 5. Shem. And Shem was righteous. And Shem was a good man and followed God after the flood. And Shem had descendants. You know who Shem's descendants were? If you continue to look in Genesis chapter 11, there was a man, man named Abram. <coughs> Abram, who descended from the line of Shem. And who do you find in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? None other than Abram. So God, what? Was faithful to preserve the seed of a woman. From Seth to Noah to Shem to Abraham and to who? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. And remember in Genesis chapter 3, 
Verse 15. This word seed can refer to what? An individual or a group. We see the group. The godly line of sect. Now I want you to see the individual. The Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Genesis 3.15 prophesied. It would not be the seed of the man, but the seed of who? The woman. Seed of the woman. So turn with me to Galatians chapter 4 in the New Testament. I want you to see this. The seed of the woman in Galatians chapter 4, verse 25. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians 4, 4. In the New Testament. God had the seed preserved through the line of Seth, through the line of Abraham, and to the time of Christ. But look when the seed comes. Galatians 4, 4. When the fullness, look at that, the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a... Woman born under the law. Did Jesus Christ have a human father? No, he was conceived of who? The Holy Spirit of God, correct? Jesus Christ did not have an earthly father. He was born of the virgin Mary. He was born of the woman. Do you think the virgin birth is important? Because Jesus Christ, what? He did not inherit the sin nature that we have. Because he was not born of a human father. He was born what? Of a virgin birth. And it says in the fullness of time, the Bible says, when it had come, God sent forth his son, the seed. That's the reason it's capitalized in Genesis 3.15. The seed. And was born of a woman. The seed of the woman. And he was born under the law. But we know what? He perfectly kept the law. He never sinned or broke the law. He perfectly fulfilled the law. And then the Bible says in Galatians 4, 5, He redeemed those who were under the law. That we might receive the adoption as who? Sons and daughters of God. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, What? Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through who? Christ. When Christ was crucified on the cross, was that a wound that He took? Did He suffer for our iniquities? Did He suffer for our sins? Was He our substitute? Was that a wound that He took? Yes. Why did He pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? What? Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from Me. And He prayed so hard. Do you remember? He prayed. What? And He sweated blood. He was so, He was so caught up in the passion and in the suffering He was going to have to endure. Taking on the wrath of God upon Himself in that garden. When Christ died upon that cross and breathed His life, and His body was there, beaten beyond recognition, not really even recognizable, was that a wound? Oh, yes. But was it a mortal wound? No. Because what happened the third day? The Lord Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. Death had no victory Amen. over the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did God raise Jesus Christ from the dead? Because God, in this, when He raised Christ from the dead, what it symbolized that He had accepted in full Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice, the redemption for the sins of the world. And all who what? Believe in His name and trust in Him as Savior. Make Him their Lord. What does Galatians chapter 4 say? We have been redeemed. We're not under the law anymore. We are under grace. And what does the Bible say? You are sons and daughters of God. And He has sent forth His Spirit into your hearts. And we can cry out what? Abba, Father. You 
you are a child of God. If you belong to the seed of Jesus Christ. And you are not under condemnation. Because what did God say to the serpent and his seed? The serpent and his seed is what? Under the condemnation of God. And condemnation simply means the sins pronounced with punishment to what? Follow. There will be punishment to follow. But those who are under the seed of the woman, the seed of Jesus Christ, can be sure there is therefore now no condemnation to us. And Romans chapter 5 explains that so well. I want you to turn there in your Bible. Romans chapter 5. I want you to look at verse 12. Because this had to be, God ordained this, and God was not surprised by the fall of Adam and Eve. He had a Redeemer in mind. He had a promised one in mind. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. The Bible says, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. That's right, because we inherited the sin from Adam. Because Adam is a type of him who was to come. Let's stop there for a minute. How is Adam a type of Christ? Well, think about this. There are two men, two men in human history who affected the rest of their fellow man more than any others. You know who they were? Adam and Christ. Because Adam, what, took of the fruit and he ate and it what? It cast all humanity into sin. Sin was inherited from our head, Adam, the first man. But he was a type. Because there's a second man that came, the seed of the woman, the promised one, the Messiah. Who would what? Who would undo that curse? Let's read on verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. It's not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense, that's Adam, many died. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man who, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came to the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses, offenses resulted in justification. You know what the opposite of condemnation is? Justification. The opposite of being condemned is to be what? Justified. How are we justified? In Christ. Through Christ. Every person is condemned. How are you justified? Faith in Christ. It's not like the offense. It resulted in justification. Look at verse 17. For by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Death reigns through Adam. Much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in what? Life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in what? Condemnation. There's that word again. Resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. I know what we read is deep doctrine. I know Romans chapter 5 is hard to understand. But it's really not hard to understand if you know you've been justified, you know God has declared you righteous because you believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. And you're not under condemnation anymore. That's the reason Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. How do you know you're in Christ Jesus? You say, well, you've got to believe, Pastor. You're exactly right. How do you know if you believe? 
Because look at what Romans 8 1 says. You do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You don't walk according to the flesh, but you walk according to the Spirit. That's how you know. You are not under condemnation, but you've been justified, and you are in Christ. Because you don't walk by the flesh, but you walk by the power of the Spirit. So, the title of this morning's message is simply, Whose Seat Are You? Because that's something that every human being has to answer. Whose seat are you? Sitting here in your pew today. You've heard the truth of God's Word. You know the seed of the serpent. You know the seed of Christ. How do you know? Can you be sure? Whose seed are you? Are you under condemnation or have you been justified by faith in Christ? You say, well, Pastor, I believe. And isn't that all that's required? No, the Bible says if you do believe, you what? You won't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And you will live a life that is different from those who are the seed of who? Of Satan. Because Jesus said, you know what? Jews, you think you're, you think you're the seed of Abraham, but you're not. Because you don't what? You don't do the works of Abraham. You're not expressing the changed life. Because you haven't been what? Born again. You haven't been born again. And Jesus told Nicodemus what? Surely I tell you, Nicodemus, unless one, unless a man is what? Born again. <coughs> he cannot enter the kingdom. So whose seed are you? The last place we're going to be this morning is 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I want you to see this about walking in the Spirit and a saint's life. How are we are supposed to live if we have indeed belonged to Christ? If we've been what? Born again. If we're under the seed of Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. The Bible says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawless. And you know that He, Christ, was manifested to, to what? Take away our sins. And in Him there is what? No sin. In Him there is no sin. Whoever abides in Him does not sin. Let me say that again. Whoever abides in Christ does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. But he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. That's why Genesis 3.15 exists. The Son of God was manifested that He might what? Destroy the works of the devil. What will the seed of, of, of the woman do? Remember that in Genesis 3.15? He shall what? Bruise your head. Crush the head of Satan. How did He do that? When He atoned for our sins on the cross, what was Satan's most powerful tool? Sin. Holding people in the bondage of sin. When Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead, He what? He destroyed. He destroyed the works of the devil. He destroyed the weapon of sin. He destroyed the works of the devil. And whoever has been born of God does not sin. Look at this. For his seed remains in that person in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. When we read this in 1 John 3, 4-9. And I preached all the way through 1 John. Some of you may remember this. Most of you probably don't. But the Bible here is not talking about a sinless life of perfection. Because what? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the Bible here is not talking about a sinless state of perfection. We all what? Still sin. But as Christians, if the seed of Christ remains in us, what does the Bible teach? We will confess our sins. And knowing that Christ is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know this. This is why the Bible says if, the, if, if Christ's seed is in us, we will not what? Fall into habitual practice of <coughs> sin. We won't continue to sin. We won't be under the bondage of sin. Our lives will be different than the lives of the seed of Satan, than the unbelievers out there. Our lives will be different. It will be marked by what? Obedience and faith in Christ. 
It will be marked by what? Works of righteousness. And yes, we sin. Yes, we make mistakes. But what? We confess those sins quickly. We keep short accounts with God. And we know whose seed remains in us. And we know we practice righteousness because He is righteous that dwells within us. And friends, that's a Christian life. That's what it means to really follow Christ. His seed is in you. The seed of Satan is what? Then crushed, stomped down, and done away with. The works of Satan has been destroyed. Not by you, but by Christ who died for you. And when you believe in Him, He forgives you of your sins, and He's done away with them on the cross. And what? He gives you. He imputes to you His righteousness. So you have been what? Truly born again. We talk about born again Christians all the time. Also, oh, so has been born again. Do we really know what it means? What does it mean to be born again? It means what? That old seed of the serpent, of Satan, is what? That old sinful nature has been dealt with, crucified on the cross. With Christ. And God has given you what? A new spirit. You've been born again. Because the seed of Christ dwells within you. And you're going to be a different, changed person. You're not going to follow the old ways and be under the bondage of the life that you used to know. Oh, my concern, this message has been lost. It's been lost. Throughout time, throughout denominations, throughout feel good, prosperity messages, and feel good and short ser sermonettes that last 10 minutes that try to tell you how to live what? A good life, good enough. No. The seed has to be the seed of Christ Amen. that lives within you. It's got to be. Whose seed are you? Whose seed are you? <clears throat> Father, we praise you and thank you for this, your truth, and your word. And God, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, such a rich verse. But God, we have to understand, you have been faithful. You have kept the seed alive. Throughout the generations, throughout the Old Testament, all the time through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Israelites, all the way down to when Mary gave birth to Christ, you kept the seed of the woman alive, Lord. You preserved the seed. And the seed of Satan, if you read through the Bible, Father, we know the seed of Satan sought to conquer, sought to kill and destroy the seed of the woman. But Lord, you preserve because you are faithful. And God, in due time, in a proper time, there was a young girl named Mary. A simple, a very, very obedient and very blessed young woman who had a visit by the angel Gabriel. That said, rejoice, highly favored one. For you have found great favor with God, and you are with child of the Holy Spirit. And you will conceive and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. And Lord, the seed became a person. The promised seed was Jesus Christ. And He lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the law. He never sinned, but He went to the cross and He died for us. He died for the sins of the world, for every person in this room. He died. He took our place. For the sins we committed, He paid for them. And it's the reason that the Bible says, by grace 
we have been saved. Not of works, lest any person should ever boast. Oh, living God, we boast in Christ today. And I pray, Lord, that every person that's hearing my voice can say with full assurance that they are the seed of Christ. His seed dwells within them. They are not living a life under the bondage of any sin. They have been born again. Sir, my teenager, young child, whose seed are you? You can become a child of God. But you cannot save yourself. You have to believe that Jesus Christ has died for you. And you have to make Him Lord of your life. You have to allow Him authority in your life. You have to give Him preference and honor. You have to make Him Lord. You have to believe that God has raised Him from the dead. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Will you do this now? Do it now. God is listening. sins and turn away from them and turn to faith in Christ. If you have prayed to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, God would ask of you and require of you that you come forward. And let me pray with you. I will not speak to you. I will not ask you to say anything to the congregation. I want to pray with you. And we need to arrange your baptism. You need to be baptized. If you pray for forgiveness of your sins and to receive Christ and you are a new creation. Come forward during the invitation. Believer, if you need prayer, come forward and pray at the altar. Don't wait. But let's get right with God for He has spoken. We must respond. And Holy Father, thank You. Lord Jesus, thank You. Holy Spirit, thank You for this day and for Your true Word. And for your people, your church, sanctify us, O oh God. Make us more like Christ. Make us more like Him. For He is our head now, not Adam, but Christ. He is our Lord. We are of His seed. Let us live that way. For we pray these things in His holy and righteous name. Amen.